Now, I'm, I'm a little kind of disappointed. Where are you going? <laughs> I'm just about to be humble. Like, where am I? Just because we don't have children's church doesn't mean I'm not going to talk to the kids. Kids should come on up here. I'm staring at a few of them. And look, you can try to bring him on the line with you. <laughs> what is up with that? Oh yeah, just because we don't have children's church doesn't mean I'm going to discontinue the kids talk. This is my favorite part of service. Alright, so I, I want to ask y'all, something big is happening this month. Does anybody know what it is? You don't. Wait, you're telling me only three people know what's going on this month? Okay, four. Okay, so why don't y'all fill, fill us in? Fill us in on what's going on this month. It's December. We're done with that. Okay, Christmas. Okay. Oh, yeah. Some, oh, yeah. Wow. It's the first time I've ever seen a group of kids this size not get excited about Christmas. You have, you have something to add to that? Christmas is Jesus' birthday. All right. Wow, she just brought it right <laughs> home. All right, so what's your favorite part about Christmas? Go for it. About getting toys. Getting toys. <laughs> We're going to have to have some talks there, son. Getting presents. Getting presents. Giving Pre people presents. Giving people presents. I like that. Presents. All right, so <laughs> let, let's just kind of cut Who thinks the best part about Christmas is presents? Raise your hand. Wait, 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 so I'm just going like, to kind of talk to this group of four girls who's not responding to anything. You're just laughing at me. I don't know, you're like, he's behind me. I'm just teasing you. All right, so I'm going to ask you, then, what is, what is your favorite part of Christmas? Huh? Meeting Santa? Okay. Meeting Santa? Meeting Santa and being Santa. <laughs> Just don't grow a beard. It'll be awkward for all of us. All right, but something else happened. The real reason why we give gifts, and, and by the way, did you know that Santa actually, the real Santa actually worked for Jesus? Not like, like men, but he was a, a guy who was a good Christian man who decided to give gifts to people <laughs> Who are in need, and that's why we get gifts. Celebrating Jesus' birthday. Yeah, it's the only day of year where we don't get something on someone else's birthday. Home. So why do we really celebrate? What what reason do we have to celebrate Jesus? Why do you think we have a reason to celebrate Jesus? Because he saved us. Because he said, because he was the savior for the world. Because he was the savior for the world. Because he's our God. Because he's our God. How about this one? And I know this one might be over your pay grade. But what about the best reason to celebrate is that God keeps his promises. Because Jesus was promised. Did you know that Jesus was promised? In so many verses in the Old Testament, God told the people of Israel, I'm going to send you somebody who's going to come take care of all the sin problems, and he's going to help bring peace on earth, he's going to do all these things. And in that little feeding trough, because that's what a manger is, that little feeding trough, this little tiny baby, was God making good on his promises. Huh? Is that a song? His throne. Is the manger his throne? Yeah. Jesus grew up, son. It would be kind of weird if we get to heaven and he's still sitting in it. <laughs> they all thought it was funny. I don't care what you're <laughs> Yes, Miss Grace. Are you going to, you, believe, you would believe in Jesus even if, if Christmas wasn't his birthday? Oh. You want, you want to come up here and preach for me today? No. no? Okay. Jesus got faith. I mean, she's like, I would just believe in Jesus even if it wasn't his birthday. I love it. 
All right, guys, well, we're going to talk about it today, and guess what? For the next month, y'all get to hear me talk, and the adults too, because they haven't heard me talk in a while. And so we, get, we got these little things, just in case you want to follow along or you want to draw or something. This gives you little things to follow along with, because we're not going to have children. <laughs> And so I want you guys to maybe take a little bit of a notes or something that stuck out. Can you tell me, brother, Brian, this is where you got it wrong, okay? You guys keep me accountable, okay? Thumbs up? All right, go back and sit with your parents. Unless you're the preacher's kids to stay where you're at. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get me back preaching. I have been really blessed. And I'm grateful for the men who have stepped up and, and, and have led us. And uh, most of that was according to plan. And I'll tell you, it's sometimes good as a preacher just to sit back and let the Word of God feed you. And thank the Lord we have men who are uh, grounded in the Word of God who take up that charge and, and feed the way God calls us to. Well, today we're going to get into the Christmas season, and I know I typically preach through a book of the Bible at a, at, a, at a time, but you might have noticed going through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the complete story is actually only spoken of in Matthew and Luke. So, you might be confused because we're flipping back and forth within the Bible, but I don't care. We're, we're going to go through it. We're going to do it. We will do this together. And so, if you will, mark your Bibles for Matthew and Luke. We're going to stand and we're going to... Start at Luke chapter 1, and we are going to uh, get into God's Word this morning. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. You know, I, I really do love Christmas time. But I'm not sure if you've noticed the things I've noticed. You know, I don't have as much mileage as some of y'all, and I'm not going to uh, get to an age-guessing game here. But in the 37 years I've been on this earth, I have noticed a gradual shift in our focus on Christmas. Used to be, on uh, almost every single channel, you'd see something about Christmas and glorifying God, even in the middle of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Frosty the Snowman. But slowly but surely, it seems like they're trying to phase the name of Jesus out because he's just a little too offensive for some people. And I think sometimes we allow these little, tiny, so gradual changes to affect the way we look at things as well. Those of you who've ever sailed on a, a boat or been in the middle of a lake uh, uh, know this is... Just a little tiny shift in degree can change the entire course of your journey. When I was younger, uh, I was living with my dad's best friend because, you know, what better way to get away from your parents than to move to somebody's house who knows them intimately. And my dad's best friend was single for a long time, so he was able to do a lot of things that uh, my parents were. And at some point in his mid-50s, he took up windsurfing. Now, he didn't go out and buy the new stuff. He was a cheapskate, so he went to a garage sale. And I think the Smithsonian was about to buy this, but he outbid them. He got this ancient, big, bulky, nasty, just huge wind surf, surfboard. And I'd never been before. So I thought I'd give it a try. You know, I'm in my early 20s. I, I can do that sort of thing. 
Well, as I'm on the surfboard, my course keeps gradually changing from where I want to go. And instead of heading back to shore, I head further and further into the middle of the lake. And this big bulky sail that weighs about 350 pounds is stuck in the water and I just suddenly give up. I, I, I started off at the shore and I started heading back to the shore, but the gradual shifts in my position ended me up in the middle of the lake and the Coast Guard had to come pick me up because I couldn't get back. Sometimes that's the way we lose our way, isn't it? It's not just one big change in direction. It's little tiny adjustments over time. And sometimes those little tiny adjustments can move us so far away from where we're trying to go that we don't even remember where we were going or why we were going in the first place. In his speech, If I Were the Devil, Paul Harvey says, If I Were the Devil, I would change the uh, image of Christmas from a manger to a bottle. And if you think about it, Christmas has subtly changed. But I'm here to tell you this morning, the story and the message of Christmas is and always shall be that Jesus fulfilled God's word, that God is not done yet, and that God has a plan for this broken heart. So as we're going through this series this morning, as we're, we're going through the next few weeks in Matthew and Luke, I want us to focus that the real reason for the season is Jesus Christ and Christ alone. It doesn't matter what you put or get under that tree. The greatest gift we have ever been given or ever shall receive is Jesus Christ. Amen. And we need to give the good news message at Christmas. So the first question I pose with this first verse is, Mary, did you know? Anybody like that song? I used to like that song, and then I heard it every single Christmas at church for about 30 years. And so I still like the song, but it gives me sometimes PTSD. As long as it's not Christmas shoes, I'm okay. But let's think about this. This message of Christmas was first told to a single unwed mother. Mary was not yet married to her husband. And she's sitting here and she's, I don't know what she was doing on that day. We almost like to envision she's sitting in a garden praying, right? That's usually the pictures that we see. And this angel just appears to her and says, blessed are you. I don't know about y'all, but if I'm in there washing dishes or mowing in the yard and an angel just appears to me, I'm going to get a little bit freaked out. What's more, if he says, blessed are you and you found favor with God, I'm going to think, what did I do? And that's exactly what happened with Mary. She doesn't understand this greeting. And the angel tells her, don't worry, Mary. God is doing something good. This promise that Israel has been given from the moment God thought of her is coming true inside of you. The Holy Spirit is going to conceive inside of you. And you are going to give birth to a son. He's going to be great. Now Mary, of course, is alarmed. And I think she is rightly so. Let's take a look. Verse 34, Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. This is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. What a wonderful promise. This morning, Wes and I were having a little bit of a theological discussion, and I love that. Wes and I have such great conversations. And he asked me, how could Jesus have simply just set aside his godhood well, in the Psalms, we are told, for I was brought forth in sin. Jesus was conceived in the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus was promised from the beginning to be the man that I should have been. From the start, what do I know about God and his plan from the beginning? Well, in the beginning, God made it all good. There was nothing that God created that he said, this is not good. The only thing that God said was not good 
What's the one thing he hadn't created yet? It is not good for a man to be alone. But unfortunately, humanity got curious. And Satan, the way he does, causes us to doubt by asking, did God really say? And so the perfection of God in the garden where God said, be fruitful and multiply. You take dominion here on earth and I will rule in heaven above. And, and we will rule together. Was broken and ruined. Because we wanted to take more than we were given. But God had a purpose. God had a plan. All the way back from Genesis. And we're going to be going over these promises more and more as we continue through the week. All the way back in Genesis. God, even in the sin of Adam and Eve, promised salvation. He looked at the serpent and as he cursed the serpent, he said, You and the woman's offspring will be at war with one another. He will crush your hand, but you shall bruise his heel. From the very moment that we made our first mistake, God found a way out. God had it planned. God's plan was perfect. And you see, Mary, who didn't expect this gift to come upon her. I mean, imagine that. I mean, I, we, we've seen this before. Many of us have experienced this in our families. Single, unwed mothers. It's scary. It's scary raising your kid even if you have a partner who understands. But here's a young woman in a time where if she was caught having adultery, could have been dragged out into the streets and stoned to death. Being told she was going to have a baby. Being told that it was God's. And not only that, that this baby would change the very face of the earth. <coughs> I remember one of the biggest, nastiest letters I ever received in the mail was writing about this single unwed mother who carried forth the greatest gift of all. Let's think about this. God used something unexpected to change the world. If you were God, how would you choose to handle this? Matter of fact, if I was Jesus, I'd say, okay, Lord, see right there, that palace, that's where I want to be born into. But I'm not him because I'm imperfect. I have my imperfect wants, wishes, and desires. God used a single, unwed mother to bring forth his plan. The virgin conceived and gave birth because nothing is impossible with God. It also goes to show us that no matter what our circumstance in life, if we choose to submit to the will of God, God will make all things beautiful in its own time. And so this single unwed mother, we'll talk about how she responded in just a little bit, was told that she would be given a gift for the entire world. Let's go on real quick to Matthew. If you will, open up to Matthew 1, 18 to 23. I cheat. I got my mark. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, Resolved to divorce her quietly. Let's stop there for just a second. What Joseph was doing here is, un is, is pretty unprecedented in that day and age. Back then, many women were treated as property. Just because I'm your daddy doesn't mean I won't get off the stage. Women were sometimes treated as property, and they weren't treated very nicely, and they were given uh, almost in marriage as, as bargaining chips sometimes. But Joseph looked at this woman who he was betrothed to wed. He saw that she was pregnant and he wanted to take care of her. When a man was to give a woman a certificate of divorce, he was to also put up for her future to make sure that she was taken care of. So instead of dragging her out in the middle of the street and having her stoned to death, Joseph was going to put her up somewhere, make sure that she and the child were provided for and even though they weren't yet officially married, he was willing to put his own name on the line. Think about how good that is. And think about Joseph's position in life. 
Joseph, anybody know what he did for a living? Make sure you're paying attention. He was a carpenter. Matter of fact, we, we kind of think of almost using wood, but back then in Israel, as a carpenter, he was a stone carpenter. Israel is a very stony place. And the Jews actually have a belief that God just set all this down so that they could fortify themselves. But Joseph was a stone carpenter. He was well off as far as his profession. He uh, always was going to have work because guess what? Humans, we like to multiply. We like to build houses. He was always going to have work. But, only, but something else was special about Joseph. Does anybody know? Joseph was a direct descendant of whom? Well, Abraham, yes. I mean, if you want to like go all the way back. Who? David. David. More importantly, he was a direct descendant of the royal line through Solomon. And Joseph, if you think about it, is the son of a disgraced house. Because the kingship was removed from Solomon's line. Because the kings could not uphold the law of God. And so God removed their privilege. But Joseph still carries some of that part of David. I'm going to do what's right. And even though his house has fallen far, Joseph is still an honorable man. It's amazing that God chose him. Here we go. Verse 20, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call her his name, his name, Emmanuel. What's Emmanuel mean? God with us. What beautiful words. And so this question I ask this is, Joseph, what were you thinking? We don't know. In the narrative of the Bible, Joseph has no speaking lines at all. But what we do know of Joseph is that Joseph obeyed the voice of the Lord. God said, I'm going to do it. Joseph, the son of a disgraced house, a house where the, the men were kings who ruled over the nation of Judah, working as carpenters, trying to work out a living as best they can. Joseph had a choice. To marry a woman who another man had known and who conceived a child that was not his could have brought even further shame and dishonor to his family. Back then, they had a lot of rules and a lot of laws. If you read through, and I highly suggest you do, Deuteronomy and Leviticus, God has a reason for these laws. God wanted his people to be pure and holy. And when God appointed kings, the kings were supposed to lead the people into his purity and holiness. And here is a son of a disgraced house that God is giving the opportunity to redeem themselves in the most unconventional manner. <clears throat> take this young woman who is promised to you, who is pregnant, and take her to be your wife, for this thing is from the Lord. Could you imagine what the neighbors must be thinking? We all know how it goes. I mean, especially in a small town, it's a lot worse. When something happens, everyone knows about it. Right? Anyone ever see that Norman Rockwell painting with the, the people staring at each other and then this person goes and turns into another person and so on and so forth? That's what it's like in a small town. And from what I understand, Galilee wasn't a very big town at the time. Could you imagine the whispers that Joseph and Mary had to endure with knowing that God had promised them something? That's the thing they had to consider. I love what Jesus had to say on it. Jesus said in the book of Luke, if you're to follow after me, first consider the cost. Which of you, after building himself a tower, would begin to build without first considering how much it costs? Because if you begin to build, and you can only have enough money to build half of it, your friends and neighbors will mock and laugh at you. In other words, 
is Jesus is telling us. When God calls, it's going to sound strange to those who don't understand. When God calls, there's going to be things He asks you to do that, that really, honestly, to your own common sense, are going to make little sense. Obey anyway. And Mary and Joseph were both given a choice. Let's look at how they responded. If you will open with me to Luke chapter 1, 38. It's going to help if you mark your Bibles for future reference. I love Mary's response. Verse 38, And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I can only imagine what's going on through this young girl's mind. Mary likely was between the age of 12 and 14. And she had to sit down and ponder this choice that was put before her. Her parents were going to ask. And I wonder, was it a Roman who did this to you? How did this happen? Didn't we raise you better than this? But God understood. And what's more, I'm going to tell you something. If you respond to the call of God, He will provide for your needs. When Mary was obedient, this is what happened. Verse 39, in those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, to the town of Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Isn't it great that God provides a place for Mary to go and grow? Your friends and neighbors won't understand this, but Elizabeth will. You see, what happened to Elizabeth a few months before? This older woman who was barren was given a gift of a son. And her husband, Zechariah, couldn't quite understand it. And so he questioned God and acted like God was a fool. And so what did God do? God shut his mouth. But Elizabeth, who experienced firsthand the work of God, her lips were open. Check this out. This is amazing. And when Mary heard the greeting, or excuse me, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. The first person to celebrate the good news of the gospel was not even born yet. The Holy Spirit, and I'm going to tell you something, I don't care what your stance on this, I'm going to tell you my experience is the Holy Spirit can't fill, I'm not going to call it a fetus, a baby in its mother's womb. Amen. All of my children, and I'm just going to, I'm sorry to embarrass you, Xander, you're here. But before Xander was in this world, at least on the outside, he would dance when we worshiped. Even before we are physically entering this world, the Holy Spirit moves us. And John the Baptist, who was the herald of Christ, celebrated first. God is good. I want to tell you something. is When, when we are asked to do something and God says this is a, an impossible task, but I'm going to be with you, this is proof of Positive that God stands on His Word. God fulfills His promises. And that is what Christmas is about, Charlie Brown. God is faithful. But what's more? <laughs> and I love this. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. As her son growing inside of her was filled, so was she. That's how the Holy Spirit works. Rivers of living water. When you get good news and you receive the good news, the Lord fills you with joy and it cannot help but go to someone else. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. The first words from her cousin were, Mary, what happened? No, they weren't. The first words from her was, Mary, you've got to give it up for adoption. No, it wasn't. It was praise to God for this thing that he had done. 
God can use a single unwed mother to fulfill His purposes. What can He do for you this Christmas? We have a unique opportunity. Did you know that most people are willing to come to church if asked? And what better time to ask than when we celebrate the first time the good news was given? This news that Jesus Christ had given or had, excuse me, this news that God had given to Mary about Jesus Christ wasn't simply for Mary alone. Elizabeth felt the presence first from her own child within her and then from the Holy Spirit as he grew inside of her. And she could do nothing but praise the Lord. The thing is, God often requires the impossible, but the angel of Gabriel, excuse me, the angel Gabriel said this, nothing will be impossible with God. The good news of Christmas is that the Lord had come, Emmanuel, God with us, and through an impossible means, God promised through this virgin that he would conceive and give birth before she was ever born, before she was ever thought of, before she was ever planned or dreamed of. God picked Mary. And God fulfilled his promise. I believe in the virgin birth. It's not a story. It's history. It's his story. And if God can do that through Mary, what can he do through you? If God can use sinful woman born and conceived in sin, as the psalm says, to fulfill his ultimate plan and purpose, what can he do in your life this morning? Christmas is about rebirth. Because Christ came into this world and when he was speaking to Nicodemus and John, he said this, you must be born again. It's not about being a better person. The meaning of Christmas, I'm sorry for you ladies out there, is not like the Hallmark movie say. It's about reborn, newness, and walking as a new creation in life. Do you feel like that this morning? Do you feel as though you are walking in the newness of life? Has Christ filled your heart so that you are walking each and every day like it's a gift? Well, you should. Lift your head up. Christ has come. The promise has been fulfilled. And on that cross, so many years after he was born, he finished the contract with God. He crossed the T with his arms. And he dotted the eyes with his blood. It is finished, he said. Are you living like it has been? This child that was to come into the world promised to marry, and as it grew, brought the Holy Spirit into even other babies as they were growing. Brought about newness. Elizabeth, barren in her old age, and yet able to conceive a child, spoke of newness. God was doing something new. And all Mary had to do was just believe. This morning, God wants to do something new in you. He's a God of creation. He doesn't want you to be a better version of yourself. He wants you to be new in Him. And this gift you can receive at Christmas is newness in life. We're also going to look real quick. If you flip back to Matthew 1, hopefully your fingers marked it. We're going to see how Joseph responded. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. We don't know much about Joseph, but we know he believed God. And we know throughout the rest of the promises of the New Testament, it was talked about what righteousness truly is. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. We know that Joseph did the same thing. There are many people here who are sitting around waiting for the promises of God to happen in their life. Waiting for God's promises to be fulfilled. But all it takes is belief. God might have asked you to do something impossible. As you read God's words, you might feel your heart is being led somewhere or being pulled somewhere. God's not up for suggestion. He's up for commands. Who's willing to follow this morning? Mary and Joseph were asked to do something impossible. Mary was asked to conceive and carry a son. 
And Joseph was asked to bring him into the world and raise him. And thank God that they listened. God took Joseph, a man born of kings and yet living life as a carpenter. And he restored his family honor. God took this young girl, Mary, and what I love about this, and this is something that we don't have real much time to touch on, but he took this young girl to be a witness for him. The first witness of the miracle that he's about to do. If you know the significance of that, Back in those days, a woman's testimony in court was not evidence. And yet God chose to talk to Mary first. You see, through Christ Jesus, God was undoing the curse that we brought on ourselves. It was a woman who first ate the fruit, and it was a woman who first heard the good news. God is a God who fixes the problems we make. God promised something to Eve back in the garden that her offspring would undo the evil that they had done. And through Christ Jesus, God did just that. This morning, I want to ask you, are, are you facing something unexpected, something impossible? Is God putting something on your life? And you're just thinking to yourself, well, what about my finances? Mary didn't ask that question. As far as we know, neither did Joseph. Are you facing something? Well, God, what about my relatives? What about my family? God, what about this? What about that? Well, here's the thing. Mary and Joseph, from what we understood, took this unexpected bit of news. And they said, Lord, we will do what you say. And because of that, you and I are here today and we are blessed because of what Christ Jesus did when he came into this world. God is calling. Are you going to take that call? Maybe this morning you've never given your life to Christ and as um, the worship team comes up, if you've never given that Christ, but maybe you feel God calling you, I want to invite you. And if you're willing to pray for somebody, would you please come forward? Maybe God has called you to come forward and finally give up. Finally give your life. Finally say, Lord, you can do this because I know I can't. That promise that Gabriel gave to Mary still holds true. With God, nothing will be impossible. Maybe you're facing something this morning. Maybe you're in an impossible marriage. That you don't know what to do anymore. You've tried everything. But God has put you there for a reason. With God, nothing will be impossible. Maybe you're facing a choice at your job, or maybe you're facing something in your life. I want to ask you to come forward and just trust God. Ask for prayer. We have people who are willing to come and pray with you, but don't let another thing go by. We know from this Christmas story that God is not without a purpose. I love what Corey Ten Boom said. There are no emergencies in heaven, only plans. For Mary, this must have felt like an emergency, but she went with God's plan. For Joseph, he was trying to figure out what he was going to do. And God said, Joseph, this is all been taken care of. And all they did was take care. They, they, they followed Jesus. They, they walked alongside him. They raised him. They, they took him in as their own. And you and I are sitting here today because of that. Take a step of faith. Trust in God. And know that because we're celebrating this season, we can trust that God will fulfill His promises to you. As we stand, let's sing and praise